<laughs> we are live now. Um, hi, welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, my special guest just flew in. This is a this is a budgie. I we he kind of flew into the local park a few weeks ago, and um, I swear he came. You know, he started off as being like just stay away from me. To now, he just follows me everywhere, and he talks. Now he keeps saying, "I'm a parakeet. I'm a parrot," and he beatboxes. So he. Very good well, man. he's he's he looks very uh, he looks very companion. Yes, you know, or that, whatever that you know, <laughs> he likes you. Yes, no, he just flew in, but uh, right when I didn't start. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, Doctor Tolly, um, the glasses are very fly, very fly. Uh, so we're coming into the Halloween season. You want to tell us if anyone anyone want to guess who Doctor Tolly is? Um, his, his fly glasses there. Uh, <laughs> All right, you have to tell us now. What? Who, who are you? With those glasses, Elton John. Yes. I'm, and I'm an early Elton John. He 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 still wears glasses, but uh, he's known for his his early to mid seventies, where he had a number of different glasses that he wore in that time. So this is this is early Elton. Early Elton. Nice. Yes. Yes. Nice. Now, don't ask me to sing because I'm not going to be able to do that. But That's my next, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I so, just don't know the words to Benny and the Jets. You do, but I can make them up, as we okay. say. <laughs> that that would be a. It's it's got a lot of the same replay on the chorus there, so I think you could nail that one pretty effortlessly <laughs> on on a um and a live uh, song there. Uh, hey, you know, so we are coming up into the holiday season, uh, sorry, well, holiday season, but specifically we have Halloween coming up. And I just read a fascinating thing, just real quick while I wait for people to log in, that the movie, The Birds, remember that Alfred Hitchcock movie? That was actually, it's loosely based on real events of birds that were crashing into buildings and people in the Monterey Bay area in the 60s. So I thought that was really fascinating that, um, I remember trying to watch that movie when I was little and I actually had my first bird and I thought I watched a movie because it came on TV called The Birds. I thought, what a great movie to watch with my bird. I'll watch this movie with my bird. And then I realized it was a scary movie. And so I left the room and then I realized to my horror that my bird had sat there and watched the whole movie by himself. And I was convinced that my bird was going to attack me for like three days after that because oh, wow. he sat and watched the entirety of The Birds. Well, uh, that is a good Halloween story. That's my bird story, Halloween, Halloween theme. <laughs> and I'm yeah. glad he didn't attack you. No, he was a sweetie pie, but you know, that's a scary movie when you're like nine years old. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, very much so, very much so. <laughs> All right, so, so Dr. Tolley, um, we, were, we were briefly chatting about the previous webinar, um, the question that came in and you wanted to, apparently this has, sat with you since then and it's something that you wanted to address in this webinar so if you want to go ahead and we'll talk about that briefly and then we'll jump into some more questions well at, at the last uh, webinar uh, a call one of the attendees had asked about n-acetylcysteine as the antioxidant effects and i i, I believe one their veterinarian had prescribed it for their bird and wanted to know what the benefits were and how effective it was. And I, I mentioned at the time we use acetylcysteine as kind of a mucolytic agent, um, and, but I wasn't aware of its antioxidant uh, effects, but uh, I wanted to find out and, and look that up. And, and so I said I would do so and, and mention it at this webinar. And I found that uh, in fact, her veterinarian uh, was uh, using it as an antioxidant, uh, as, as an antioxidant agent, and uh, it has been used in humans, <clears throat> in particular those with respiratory disease (COPD), uh, as an antioxidant at, for the antioxidant effects of uh, in acetylcysteine, and so. Uh, although there's not any information or probably very little, if any, information on the antioxidant effects of N-acetylcysteine in birds, it has been used in humans. And uh, obviously her veterinarian was hoping or is hoping that it would have similar effects in birds as it may have in, in human patients. Um, 
And so there you go. It does have antioxidant effects and, and hopefully it, it'll work for, for her bird, um, but there's just uh, little to no information on its effects in, in birds that I'm aware of. <clears throat> Oh, fascinating! Thank, oh. Uh, that's a uh, that was very uh, cool that you just uh, that you looked into that because uh, I know uh -huh. that was one that we were you had we were scratching heads the last time we did the webinar. It was it was my homework. It was my homework, and 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 we learn all the time, and um, and so that's what's so so wonderful about uh, what I do and and medicine in general. There's always something to to learn, and uh, we go from there. Nice. Um, so before we. Uh, we have our first question. Just a reminder, everybody, to please use the Q&A button if you have a question for Dr. Tolley. Uh, not the chat feature, but the Q&A button. And um, this is one was from Diane, who has a 22-year-old son, Conyer, uh, that started to limp, and she brought him into the vet, and the vet found nothing wrong, said his foot was sprained, um, said his foot was sprained, no fracture, and he trimmed his nails. Well, she said the bird's still limping and unable to hold like an almond shell in the feet and stumbles when walking. Uh, crash landing because his, his feet are imbalanced. Um, so she was, so is it possible he has arthritis that might be making him unstable? Um, he has, uh, he has a soft uh, rope perches. Um, do you have any suggestions? She read that birds can get gout in their legs and wings and not to feed them egg yolks. Um, uh, so she stopped the eggs altogether to see if the walking and perching improves. Have you heard about gout in elderly parrots? Our senior citizen. And how old was this bird? How old was this 22 bird? year old uh, son Conyer. Uh, 22 year old son Conyer. So an older son Conyer. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, as far as um, the questions go, we'll, we'll go through one at a time. Uh, there was the first about arthritis, I think. Yes. Um, osteoarthritis. And there is uh, a very uh, there is a very good possibility that the, the, uh, in an older bird that this can develop. And because we are uh, caring for birds, feeding birds much better um, than ever, uh, that they are living longer lives and with being older geriatric patients, um, disease conditions uh, such as arthritis uh, do occur. Um, and this is uh, a condition that we do see in our older, older patients. Uh, one of the diagnostic tests that can be performed to determine if the bird in fact has uh, an arthritic condition in the, uh, the feet um, or the joints of the, of the lower, lower leg is they can uh, uh, radiographs, x-rays. Uh, sometimes uh, x-rays, uh, and I'm not going to say all the time, but it can show the bony and joint changes that are consistent with uh, osteoarthritis. So that's one, one um, test that can be used to try to confirm that. Um, as far as gout, <clears throat> gout is, is somewhat a uh, somewhat of a different situation. Uh, birds uh, can, can develop gout, articular gout, uh, which is involving the joints or uh, in, in what we see sometimes even uh, out, you know, within the, the toes or the lower legs uh, have gout uh, or uric acid deposits in that area. Um, but um, usually you will see those uric acid deposits as white deposits in that lower lower leg, um, and that's one one tip one bird that we see that quite often, <clears throat> more so than others. I haven't really um, uh, really diagnosed it uh, recently, but we used to see it quite quite often in budgies. Budgies would would develop gout. I even had some budgies that had gout lesions. Um, but, but for the most part, you see those, those lesions develop and it's not like within the joint and, uh, and, and it's where you can't really uh, observe them. So, uh, my thoughts are <clears throat> with the older, older Conyer that it would be more, more likely a, uh, arthritic condition than gout. 
Um, and, and also you can say, well, what else could it be? It could be some type of a neuropathy that has developed a neuro, kind of a neurologic uh, deficit uh, in that area uh, due to some type of a traumatic incident that could have occurred. And what about, um, they wanted to know, um, like this, the eggs about the, the, the correlation between um, the, the gout and the egg yolks. Is that something that you've heard of? <clears throat> no, I, uh, I haven't. Um, uh, and, and I'm not saying that that's, that, that can occur. Um, of course, in humans <clears throat> with gout, um, articular gout, uh, there it, it, many, many uh, probably of our attendees have heard, well, you have to get on somewhat of a, a, a restricted diet to reduce the chances of having those little, little uh, daggers uh, uh, really irritate the, the joints and cause extreme pain and inflammation, um, which is, is, is very painful. And, and I would say that that would, that would be also the case in, in, in birds. I, I wouldn't see it being any other way. Um, but <clears throat> as far as, as, as egg yolks, and it may be something that has been promoted, or you, don't, don't, you do not want to eat those if, in, in, with humans, um, and, and you know, that if you are with gout. Um, but I haven't really... Um, noted that in, in with birds. Um, I haven't seen any correlation. It could be, but I just haven't read about any correlation between uh, feeding egg yolks and, and the development of gout. Um, and mainly, <clears throat> uh, it, it could be because a lot of, uh, a lot of people feed egg yolks um, in, you know, to to uh, their, their parrots and, and some people do, but um, we just haven't seen a, a correlation between the two. Okay, and our next, our next question is actually another senior citizen, so to speak, question. Um, a 33-year-old African gray female, um, uh, this is from Lori, she says that the, her female gray had normal eyes four months ago, no history of eye trauma, inflammation, or pain. And then about two months ago, developed left pupil with an irregular left pupil with thinning of the iris that got worse. Um, and then they found out that um, she had diffuse um, opacity of the whole left lens, the cataract. So now she has a black pupil that looks grayish with decreasing vision. So she wants to know what's happening. How fast can something like this progress? Does the iris abnormality have anything to do with the cataract? So yeah, she's with, the, with, with an eye issue in a, in a bird, let's see. Um, she's on some, medi the, the gray's on some medications. She's on, um, okay, let me see if I pronounce these right. Uh, Ina Inalapril, Mex uh -huh. Mexican, and ginseng. Um, could any of these meds cause the issue? Um, and will this also, could this possibly also occur in the right eye? Hmm. <clears throat> well, the medications, I don't know how the medications are associated with the eye. Um, uh, you know, usually if you have eye issues that are specifically for the eye, you would have topical treatment. You have, um, it looks like meloxicam and malapril is, is uh, more of a, no, uh, you know, generalized cardiovascular um, uh, medication. So I don't know if the, uh, if there's anything being used to treat the eye, it may be <clears throat> being, uh, treat the other, the geriatric condition, maybe some cardiovascular concern there. Um, but as far as the eye is concerned, and as far as the lens opacities, when we look at birds, you know, often people will say, well, how old's this bird? Is this a, is this bird young, you know, adult old well <clears throat> lens opacities are one way in most cases to determine if the bird is 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 older um and in what i would say older if you have an african gray that's over 30 years old um this would be one way to determine that a parrot that's over 30 years old an amazon parrot that it would have 
uh, lens opacities, cataracts, if you want to call it that. Um, these, these form uh, in older birds. Um, and so there's other reasons cataracts form, but, but our lens opacities form. But uh, for the most part, geriatric is probably the most common. And, and, and is, it, is it related to your irritable or iris uh, condition? Yes, it could be. It could be. And it, it can develop in one eye and then quicker than the other eye. Um, but for the most part, both eyes will, will be affected um, by this condition. And, and so, uh, and, and, and for the most part, uh, you, we do not see any, the, the bird will maybe posture different because it wants to, to look or see better at one angle or whatever, but you may see that, um, but that would just be, it's trying to get a better vision of its surrounding environment. But otherwise, we do not see really any real uh, continued disease or progression of disease other than the bird can't see. So that it doesn't mean that the, the eye is going to become inflamed or is going to need, you know, you need treatment or what have you. Uh, the lens just becomes more opaque, like happens in, in mm, I would say, all animals, but I uh, may be wrong. There may be one animal it doesn't occur in, but most animals, including humans, dogs that, that have cataract formation. And there, is the, there are even <clears throat> a number of reports where there's been surgical removal of the, of the lens. Now they do not put a new lens in there so the bird can see like in humans where you put a new lens and the, the wow, I can see perfect. Um, but it can see better uh, than with a, with a opaque lens in there. Um, but it's not a new lens implant, but they have removed lenses from uh, larger birds and um, and, and, but it's a, a very, as you can imagine, uh, with an ophthalmologist doing the surgery uh, on a very delicate um, organ, uh, the eye, that it's a very expensive surgery uh, on that. Okay. Um, let's see, our next question is from Cassandra. Uh, Should female parrots be expected to lay eggs in captivity? Um, her research tells me no, and that if hormonal behavior is prevented, then no eggs should be laid. What's more, I have heard that how dangerous and unhealthy egg laying is. Is that true? What's your take on, on companion birds and egg laying? <clears throat> well, uh, as, as far as um, egg laying occurs, First, first about egg laying, if you have a single, a single female bird in the cage and it lays an egg, the egg will not be fertile, okay? So you don't have to worry about the egg being fertile, okay? You'll need a male to fertilize that egg if it's just a single female in there. Similar to the eggs that you receive from the store, <clears throat> when you receive those from the store, those were in, in, usually the hens are in individual cages um, and that they have not been fertilized by a male. So that's the, the first, um, I guess, statement there. The second is that it's a natural process and that under, under general conditions, if the, the animal is provided a calcium source and is maintained on a, a very, uh, very good diet, an adequate diet, that, uh, that this, this natural process, if it is laying eggs, um, that it will <clears throat> be a, a, a normal, a normal um, I guess, just physiologic uh, event. Uh, and, and really, there should not be uh, any real uh, stress as it relates to <clears throat> reducing the longevity of the bird but, uh, but it, it, it will occur. But of course, in the event of laying eggs, there's a number of things that can happen. The, 
the bird could be egg bound. Um, it could die in the process of laying the eggs. And if you have a situation where <clears throat> the bird is laying many, 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 many eggs, well, then that of course can uh, cause a significant amount of stress on the bird there. It can become immunocompromised, other disease conditions can occur. And uh, basically it, it, it wears on the physical nature of the bird. And so uh, that is a, even under the best of care, uh, there is a, a distinct possibility that it can reduce the, the lifespan of the bird. Overall, if there is an overabundance of le egg laying, in particular, if it's just one, one bird, they're not raising these, the, the, the eggs that they hatch, and uh, this can be a concern. So that's why in, in those type situations where you have uh, options of uh, hormonal treatment through implants uh, to uh, really stop ovulation to reduce the egg laying for the bird, or there's a surgical procedure uh, to, to remove the oviduct uh, to, in an attempt to stop ovulation in that manner. Um, so yes, if, there's, if there is just hyper egg laying activity, this can be what I would consider a really <clears throat> a, a, a stress on the, the, the bird's overall health and, and, and cause immunocompromised secondary disease conditions or reduce its lifespan overall. Um, but you also could have super birds that will live a normal lifespan but still lay a number of eggs. But all during that process, is when something can happen that would affect, adversely affect that, that um, egg, egg laying process where there may be egg binding or it could die in that, in that uh, condition. So does that help uh, answer it a little bit? Well, that did, that was very in depth. So I think that did uh, get to the, the meat of the, the question there. So yes, I'd say so. You're welcome, yes. <laughs> um, so our next one is from, from Jane. Um, she wants to know if you can speak about the use and effectiveness of GM, DMG, which is uh, dimethylglycine in birds. I hope I, well, DMG in birds. DMG. Yes. DMG. Which mm -hmm. is, do you know what that is? I'm probably killing the word here. It's a dime, dime it's either dim or dimethylglycine. D I M. E. Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me write this down here. Maybe my homework for this week. Okay. Or this time. D I M E. Uh huh. T H Y L G L Y C I N E. D L Y. Uh. D I M E T H Y L G as in George L Y C as in Charlie I N as in Nancy E. Any guys? Dimethyl. Dimethyl. It was my pronunciation. I'm sorry. Lysine. D lysine. Yeah, I'm. I. Uh, I will. Will see. <clears throat> D M G. Uh, and that's glycine. Dimethyl glycine. Nah, okay. I will see on that. I don't know in particular. What I'd like to know is what what it's being used for. What's what's the benefits of uh, providing dimethylglycine? Okay. You know, that's uh, that would be helpful if she could or he could provide that information. But I have not. Um, uh, I'm, I'm I'll need to to look that up, and okay. we'll 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 give that next time. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's our homework for this uh, after this. Yes, dimethylglycine. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and our next one comes from Kathleen about a cockatiel that's 16 years old and has had arthritis for a few years. Um, uh, he struggled to climb and can't fly, usually coasts to the floor. Uh, however, eight weeks ago, he fell or was chased onto the floor and broke his leg. So the cast is off. He struggles with perching, and she's wondering if... Um, 
if long term he will recover enough to go back into his large cage with his other uh, buddy, cockatiel buddies, um, or is is he kind of going to have to have um, special accommodations? That is a that is an excellent question. Uh, we just uh, I just saw, oh gosh, this week a twenty five year old cockatiel that uh, that we've been treating uh, that just can't quite stand up like it used to when it was 15 or even 10 years old. So a 25 year old cockatiel is uh, very old in my, my, uh, my, my estimation. But when you're, when you're talking about this case, <clears throat> it's just like uh, older people. Whenever you have an injury such as this, it just takes a little bit more time uh, for it to heal than when, when the animal was younger. Uh, I, you know, with the care that you're providing now, and if it has been interacting well within <clears throat> its regular cage, and you have healing of this fracture, uh, I do not see any reason why um, the bird uh, could not go back into the, the, the cage with its uh, cage mates. But it may take a little bit of time <clears throat> for physical therapy uh, to get it back up to speed, as much as speed as it has at this point in its life. But uh, nonetheless, I think that, um, that there, there can be an attempt to do that. Now, when you do this, that it's going to be very important that you uh, monitor that bird to make sure that that transition um, and, and an accommodation in back into that, that regular environment is smooth and that there's not any um, uh, problem with it getting back into that, um, that environment. But I, I really feel like if you um, really do the physical therapy and get the bird back up to, to the speed it can, that uh, you should be able to do that. Okay. And just a follow-up question is if you do have a bird that's, you know, had an injury to it, like a broken foot or leg, um, the accommodations in the cage, like you, you want to probably have the, so he's not perched up high, right? Like a, a setup yes. on the floor of the cage or like a platform type perch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, you definitely want to, uh, you know, modify that cage environment so that the bird can get around. I wish I could uh, show you a picture that the owner I don't even think that the, the owner just showed it to me on the phone where he had like perches where the perches were on the side of the cage so that the bird could use them almost as a ladder to get up to, to different levels of the cage. So it was like perches in a row and it was like a little ladder so he could go around the cage on those, on those perches. Um, and, and even this bird was free flighted at 25 years old and the, and the owner would have him fly back and forth like a three uh, over a 10 foot period, you know, uh, distance. Uh, yeah. And that was his exercise for the night. And, uh, and so uh, he, he had, so he had an injury and, and he's been working to try to get the bird uh, up again, but you want to, you do want to modify that, that cage to assist the bird because these are, as, as the, the attendee had mentioned in, in the question, this is a special needs bird. They get to a point of, of needing help, um, but in, uh, a body in motion stays in motion. So keeping the bird active and interactive is, is I think psychologically stimulating for the bird and um, is, is, uh, makes the, the bird I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a happier bird uh, by doing that. So uh, it's not, a, and so if you can get the bird into the other uh, cage uh, when it's ready and healed uh, and rehab, then I think that it's going to be uh, both psychologically stimulating and uh, behaviorally positive for the bird. Yes. All right, um, and then Frank wanted to know, are sprouts the, <laughs> sprouts are the hot topic in bird food. 
Um, are pellets and occasional fruits and veggies still the best option for good health in parrots? Like what role do sprouts play in, in a bird's diet when you have um, pellets and veggies and fruits that you also offer? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, my thoughts, see, you know, this is uh, the opinion of one here. And, um, and as far as sprouts are concerned, I, I think that that's, that could be part of a diversified diet. And if the birds like them, that is, that is excellent. Uh, the, the one thing that I would mention about sprouts is that even for humans, that there have been uh, instances of bacterial contamination with sprouts. Uh, and uh, I don't know really where uh, this contamination comes from or how it occurs, but I would say that if you do uh, use sprouts uh, as part of the diet, which um, I, I would say I like sprouts, and, and I think that um, that it would be be uh, nice to to have that as part of that that diet. But uh, to make sure that they're washed as but as as well as possible, and that they that when you provide those, that uh, they come from a, a as a reputable source as possible. Because there's, there's, when we talk about sprouts, there's this like store-bought sprouts in this produce section. And there's like, what about like this, like the sprouted seed, like the, the kits that people can buy and they sprout their own. Yeah. And that's, seed. and that's what I, I really don't know, Laura, as far as, uh, you know, if, if the, <clears throat> if some of these reports of contamination, bacterial contamination through sprouts have come from kits or from the store. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's easy to say that, oh, it was the store-bought seed um, that, that did it, um, just like the lettuce and everything else that we hear about produce uh, that's, that has bacterial contamination, um, but it may be associated with some of the kits. I'm just not, I'm just not sure, but I would just say, I, ha I, I think it would be great to, to include sprouts as a diet, and I know many people that do, um, but just make sure that they're, as, uh, that they're as clean as possible when you feed them to the bird, because there has been instances of bacterial contamination on that. Okay, and then Sandy wanted to know, uh, what microscope would you recommend for a fecal gram stain testing on a, for a lay person? So like, can any, like a bird, steward go out and, and get their own um microscope to yeah uh yeah you know that um uh that the you know that's a good question and i don't have a a a specific um brand of uh microscope that uh, you could you could uh, uh that i would recommend uh, right offhand. Uh, what uh, I would recommend is a, a microscope with three lenses, though, um, that uh, the, the highest power lens is an oil immersion lens uh, for that. Um, and so uh, that you have the three lenses on that and, and the highest lens with an oil immersion to see the bacteria. Um, but no, uh, that's just like no different that I recommend that uh, all of the attendees and, and I recommend to, to all of my uh, uh, bird owners uh, that uh, please uh, uh, do research, uh, get as much information as you can um, uh, over reputable areas on the, uh, internet. And, and if you have any questions as it relates or wants to implement something, give me a call and we can discuss it and I'll give you my thoughts on that. But it's, it, it shows that, uh, an interest and a desire to, to learn more. And if you have birds and you, and you want to, to look at the fecal gram stain, uh, or gram stain or what have you, uh, to try to assess uh, the bacteria within the, the GI tract, um, then there's, uh, there's, you know, the, go for it and uh, read up and learn as much as you can. There's a lot of information out there on that. But three, three lenses and uh, the highest an oil immersion lens. Okay. And there's a number of 
microscopes uh, like that. They're not, uh, and, and really you'd want one that's uh, a, a good one. So when I say that, that they're not, they're not cheap. A uh, cheap, uh, you know, you get what you pay for. There, I didn't come up with that quote, but but um, you can use that uh, almost every day. You get what you pay for, and and the last thing you want to, to look at is bacteria under a microscope that you, that's fuzzy or you can't see them. You know, you can't see the little the little creatures that under there and clear. Um, so learning how to do, and also uh, when we're mentioned in the microscope, I want to mention the gram stain that there, there's a little art to doing a proper gram stain. Now, who, who may be asking a question as a microbiologist and has done many gram stains, but a gram stain, there's a little art to it and there's decolorization and you can do too much and have it too decolored or what have you. So um, you have to, to, to learn how to do a proper gram stain, uh, to be able to, to read it appropriately or to assess the slide appropriately. So that's, that's the start proper gram stain. And then you go into, uh, having a, a microscope that is, um, adequate and, and they can read these slides. Fascinating. Um, I never thought about ordering a, a microscope to look at my birds. Uh, yeah, I know, I've, been, I've known a, a number of people that have over the years, usually with lar a, a, a large number of birds. Okay, uh, that's fascinating. Um, so let's see. Uh, so Carol, that's actually a good question since we're getting towards um, the winter months up ahead. Uh, do you recommend a special bulb or lamp to keep a cockatiel warm during the winter? And is there an optimal temperature to keep your thermostat at in, in your inside your home um that is a good question that that, that that's an excellent question and, and timely too um and 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 for a number of you who've been you know who've listened before uh to the webinars uh you've heard me state that birds are uh exquisitely more sensitive to heat than they are to cold um, a bird will die like that uh, if it gets overheated by a few degrees very quickly. I mean, uh, they just cannot dissipate heat where they can uh, accommodate to cooler temperatures um, to the point where there's parrots that you can see outside where there's snow, okay? Um, and, and I mean, captive parrots here in the U.S., people have taken images and pictures and stuff of that nature. But for the most part, when, when the birds in the house, they will be acclimatizing as the, as the temperature uh, decreases. So in your, your temperature is going to be, of course, generally higher in the summer, even with the uh, air conditioning on then it'll be, <clears throat> and then it'll be generally lower with the heat on in the, the winter. So, so you're looking at a, <clears throat> at somewhat of a, a gradient that I would say in the house is really insignificant uh, as it would relate to, to the cockatiel. And I'm thinking of the cock my, my cockatiels I've had or my Senegal or my budgies in the house now. They are going to, <clears throat> They're going to develop as it gets cooler, more feathers, and and so uh, they're they're acclimatizing. So whatever your <clears throat> your temperature is in your house, that'll be fine. The bird should be fine with whatever. If you're comfortable in the house, uh, and it can go down into the fifties in your house, the birds will be fine. Um, I can tell you when, when I look at a bird in January, mm -hmm. I can tell you if that bird's outside or that bird's inside. Those birds that are outside have a tremendous you know, amount of feathers, more feathers than those birds that are inside. And so it, it's just part of the, the, the whole process of acclimatizing. So your birds are acclimatizing to the change in temperature now. And it's very subtle and it's over time. 
but uh, there's no reason why the birds inside to have any special lighting or anything like that as long as the environment within the house is comfortable for you oh wow i guess the more like as long as you don't have maybe a, a heater that's pointed you know blowing on the birds sometimes kind of do a check around your bird's cage to see if you have like any kind of like people trying to heat or it's blowing at them or fireplace safety all that kind of stuff about making sure your fireplace has been cleaned yeah and i mean <clears throat> you know the one you know you probably have uh, a more um I guess, concern if there's a heater or something like that uh, blowing on the bird, uh, that you have toxic fumes coming from the heater um, that may be uh, not necessarily life-threatening to you. They still could be toxic. We just don't know how toxic they are, but, but uh, something from the heating elements or, or um, coming from the, the that may affect the bird's respiratory system. Uh, or like you said, the fireplace where there's smoke uh, that may be coming out uh, if a log rolls off or there's bad ventilation and, and it gets into the, the room where that would be uh, a problem. But um, really, uh, as I said, the, there shouldn't be anything to, of concern with uh, our parrots in the in the house in the winter or you know the summer with the temperatures that we feel comfortable with okay uh and then um we had a question from Liz that wanted to know is there a way to help a macaw with feather destructive behavior recently been to the vet and has been diagnosed healthy but they don't know what to do in order to help her stop from plucking her new feather out so Yes, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I thank you, Laura, for that question, because it's one of the most difficult uh, presentations that we see as, as avian veterinarians. It's, it's one of the most difficult because it's a behavior issue if the veterinarian, and, and, uh, and I fully believe your veterinarian is doing a fantastic job, and it said, well, it's not any, you know, we can't pinpoint any specific disease process, but it's a behavior problem. And, and so uh, when you're looking at a, uh, a behavior problem uh, such as this, and I have a, a macaw down there in the, um, in the, in, in, in our, our, our medicine ward right now. I have a macaw that I have been seeing for, I hate to say it, 34 years. And it has been um, uh, for it, it, it doing well. Uh, we have had uh, different uh, issues with, with the macaw, but for the most part, it has, it has feather, feather destructive behavior at this point. We've, we've treated a number of different issues over the years, 34 years. Uh, it's, it's a relatively significant period of time in the human life and for the most part in a bird's life. But as far as the feather destructive behavior, that's what the bird has continued to live with. Now, over the years, uh, we have looked at everything as far as the possibility and it was taken, you know, the, the owners took very good care of the bird, uh, optimum uh, uh, care, nutrition, environment, interaction, and but the bird pulled the feathers out. Where I'm going with this is that what you have is where the, you know, you go into a behavior situation and you talk and we have discussed that avian behaviors before, I believe, Laura. We've talked about when you get into this situation, you look at an avian behaviorist to try to do what you can to, to reduce the incidence of feather destructive behavior. You look at environment, we've talked about putting the birds out into the um, uh, general environment for, for sunlight, vitamin D, uh, you know, sunlight, uh, uh, giving them a, a chance to uh, have... Uh, uh, showers, uh, making, you know, it, baths for the birds, showers, um, and again, sunlight. Uh, this may be helpful. 
Uh, and again, the nutritional aspect may be helpful uh, and the environment may be helpful. Um, and, and I'm sure that your veterinarian has gone through that. Um, this is kind of somewhat of an elongated uh, answer, but this is a very difficult disease condition that you have. And you just can't put one answer in it and it'll solve it. And so you do everything on your end to try to make sure that that's covered, nutrition, environment. And, and then the veterinarian looks and makes sure that there's not a disease condition that's causing the bird to have self-destructive uh, uh, behavior here with the feathers. And at that point, then you look at the utilizing a behaviorist, an avian behaviorist uh, to try to to uh, reduce the incidence because an avian behaviorist or, or a veterinary behaviorist, if you can, you know, not only avian behaviorist, but a veterinary behaviorist uh, that um, understands and is willing to, to treat a bird, they follow that bird once the treatment started. So they have recommendations for um, your bird and they also may have uh, me medications that they feel would be helpful in trying to reduce the incidence of this bird uh, having feather destructive behavior. And they follow this out to see how well their recommendations and the treatment works. So at this point, I believe you're at the trying to uh, find a veterinary behaviorist uh, to help you with this. Now, when I get back and I've come back around to the bird that's down in our ward right now that we've been treating that has feather destructive behavior. Mm -hmm. I actually recommended that they go to uh, Dr. Andrew Lusher, who, who actually edited the book on, on um, uh, avian behavior, a veterinary behaviorist. He taught, taught at Purdue and they did visit him and, and worked with uh, Dr. Lusher, but still with all of that involved, the bird has feather destructive behavior. So even with the specialist, it, it can be a difficult situation uh, to, uh, or a condition to resolve, um, but it, yeah. it uh, can be resolved and it has been resolved in many cases, but uh, there's no one silver bullet that uh, is effective in, in stopping other destructive behavior. It's a challenge. It's a challenge for everybody involved. And, and, and I can tell you uh, that I feel the challenge as much as, as, as the owner does in saying, oh, I'm doing everything possible, but my beautiful bird is, looks like a plucked chicken. <laughs> you know, I... I and I, you bring it to me to try to, to fix it. And, and, and I feel a sincere obligation and a challenge to make that happen. Um, and then I also look for specialists to help me in these type cases. So that's, that's my answer on that. All right. Um, and then Gloria, I wanted to know, is there a natural herb to help pain for arthritic, arthritic birds, like a red pepper? So any natural remedies for arthritis? Well, um, this, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And it goes along with any, any, herbal, uh, any herbal treatments. And, uh, and, and this is for everybody on the on the, the webinar to to take home, okay? There are a number of treatments that are out there, herbal treatments that are out there um, that are recommended uh, for different different disease conditions or different different physiologic conditions or preventive measures or whatever. So you'll see <clears throat> many different um, uh, promotions for different products, herbal products out there. Uh, all I can tell you is that each species is different 
and that there is no scientific evidence whatsoever that there's any benefit or negative uh, reaction uh, to these uh, herbal products in birds. So there's no scientific evidence that there is whatever the active ingredient is, is, is even reaching a therapeutic level uh, when you provide it. Uh, there's no information on what an appropriate dose is. Um, you know, the, any dose that's probably uh, recommended uh, out there is, uh, well, we gave it and it didn't die. So there you go. But uh, there's no, no evidence that it's effective whatsoever. Um, I, I say that in, with anything that um, uh, is out there. We have, we even have medications that are, are prescribed uh, for specific um, uh, for specific disease conditions uh, that we have doses that we have been using uh, that we may have seen a treatment response, but uh, there's been no pharmacokinetic studies. There hasn't been any uh, pharmacodynamic studies, uh, but it's been used in other animals and different things of this nature that have evidence base that it is effective for treating these disease conditions. But with herbal products, um, there's nothing uh, other than, well, we believe that it works and we haven't seen any adverse side effects. So anything, uh, uh, caveat mTOR, something like that, uh, that buyer beware, you know, just there, there's no, you know, if you use it, there's nothing that says that um, it could be effective. So that's, I guess that's the basis of that. That's a great question though, but it also kind of puts, it, it should put it into perspective what you can expect. Um, you know, you may use it and you say, wow, it looks like it works. Well, that's, 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 that's fantastic. But um, is it, uh, is it in fact that or something else? Who knows? But nonetheless, um, that's, that's, that's the, that's the medical um, take on it. Okay. Um, and then we had a couple people uh, comments going back to the, the, uh, the heat lamps, the warming, you know, the, the keeping your bird warm during winter. Um, so Pat wanted to know, what about the K&H cage heater? Um, is it unnecessary? So they have one in, in, their, um, in their bird's cage. It's a K&H cage heater. So first off, is that something that you would recommend? If it's in the house, if it's in, if it's in the house with the, the regular, uh, it, you know, you have a central air, air heat and air, um, I, you, you would need any external heater. Okay. Yeah, this one sounds like it's actually made for would need an ancillary heater on that. You know, yet extra heat. Where we provide supplemental heat are to sick birds. Um, birds have, you know, we have birds' body temperatures up to 105, 100, 607 degrees. Um, so when a bird gets ill, we don't take the body temperature of the bird to try to determine if it has a temperature because when a bird um, gets ill they usually you see the birds on the bottom of the cage and their their feathers are fluffed well why are their feathers fluffed their feathers are fluffed because they're trying to maintain a body temperature they get cold birds body temperatures don't elevate when they get ill they decrease Okay. And so what we try to do when we have a sick bird is provide supplemental heat uh, to, to reduce the metabolic effect of them trying to maintain that, that body temperature. So we're trying to save energy for the bird um, by providing extra heat. When they are, when they're healthy, uh, there's, there's no reason that we need to 
to provide that extra heat. Now we're talking birds here uh, that are inside. The birds that are outside, that's a whole different story. Um, but birds that are inside, really, uh, and, and you know, I do, I do not, I don't recommend any any uh, supplemental heat source. Okay, and then there was another. Um, so we're talking about kind of you talked about birds outside versus inside. Um, so Susan wanted to what wanted to ask about UV lighting is that's that's something that's treated differently, right? The use of UV light. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yeah. UV. Uh, UVB lighting um, to me is uh, something if you can provide it um, to your birds on, on a uh, at a at a and we talked a little bit about this um, at a, a level uh, that that uh, is recommended uh, by that that light source um, is uh, is akin to uh, sunlight. Okay, uh, UVB, and they have that uh, this lighting um, at 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 pet stores. You can get that, and uh, again, it has to be at a at a, a specific distance, and it has to be direct direct on the uh, the page, so it could go through the cage bars. You don't want it going through glass or anything like that. It'll reduce the amount of UVB, um, and and this would be. Uh, very helpful, especially in the winter when you can't get the birds outside, uh, and and in the summer when it's it's too hot or something of this nature. So, so keeping it uh, the UVV is is different, and you and turn it on. You can turn it on in the morning, turn it off in the uh, in the evening, and uh, that uh, would be helpful. And always, as I mentioned, with UVV bulbs, they will continue to work. Uh, and long after the UVV uh, effect is is gone, so there is a uh, if you if you have anything uh, in your house with a uh, ex expiratory uh, expiratory date on it, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, if any the UVV light you should you should follow. Do not use it one day more than what that expiration date is on that product okay yeah I would just... it'll it'll turn on it'll turn on it'll light just like these glasses okay. but there's no uvb coming out of those glasses so throw it away you know and get a new one and it'll it'll tell you specifically how long they last for okay Okay. And with Halloween this weekend, you know, you probably want to be careful of those like Halloween strobe lights around your bird. I'm sure you might freak your bird oh, yeah. out. Right. Mm -hmm. you might have some thrashing about the cage. So uh, just keep that in mind if you're going to switch out any bulbs with some holiday themed lights for either Halloween or Christmas. Um, so, um, oh yeah. Someone said you can recycle those light bulbs. So, so there you go. Yes, um, please, please recycle <laughs> and, 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 and we are hoping that when they say that they will recycle what we put in the recycle, that it goes to a recycling plant or that they truly do recycle it and do not put it in the landfill. Yes, that's great. That's what we hope. Very good point. And then, so final question is about uh, peanuts. So Cassandra, this is the age old questions. Peanuts, are they allowed or are they not allowed? Can you go out and Offer your I birds in, in shell or out of shell peanuts. I think in moderation and, and as a treat uh, that uh, I allow my birds to have a peanut or two, if they. Uh, but uh, again, in in moderation. What about the source? Um, there was some. Oh, I, I I recommend the source coming from a commercial um, parrot. Uh, if the you know, I don't recommend the green peanuts or the. Uh, anything. I, I recommend it if the, the source comes from a commercial food company that uh, for parrots, uh, that that's, that's uh, adequate. What about the, the bins at the grocery store where you can like scoop in a bag full of like in shell? No, I would, I would I, you know, I would, I would say just to, to be safe and conservative uh, parrot uh, from uh, uh, those that have been manufactured uh, for parrots. Uh, okay. that for feed for, for parents. Yeah, that's what I would say, just to be conservative. 
Yeah. You know? And it's not to say that you could probably get them out of the bin for years and years and the parrot will do fine, you know? Um, but uh, again, uh, you, you, you have quality, you have a little bit more quality control uh, over that in the, the, uh, those commercial products with peanuts in it for parrots. Okay, um, I think that is all we have time for today. Um, and it, it's, it's awesome, you, you gave yourself another homework assignment, so. We'll I did, I did. No, well, it's awesome that uh, we have such great attendees yes. that continue to push the envelope here. And I am forever grateful for that. And we will learn about dimethyl glycine next time. Yeah. There we go. We'll know all about, we'll know all about it next to ask to that, which by the way, is going to be on November 19th. Um, and just to give a preview of what we have coming up for November, I can't believe it's already November almost. Uh, we've got uh, the Gray Way, Home for the Holidays, Pet Bird Safety Tips from Lisa Bono on November 5th. And then uh, Avian Vet Insider, the familiar and the rare uh, bird species avian vets have treated with Dr. Lamb. And then Dr. Tolley, you come back on November 19th for that aspect. So Thanksgiving. Oh, yes. All right. Well, do a thing one there. I'm, I want to see like one of those turkey hats on your head. <laughs> yes, yes. And we'll have to think about the turkeys that get pardoned by the president. There you go. Yes. There you go. Well, we'll do some mm -hmm. turkey facts maybe for um, yes. So we have a winner for a giveaway today, and let's see, that is going to go out to Jane. Jane H., congratulations. You Yay, are going to Jane. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> that makes your weekend and your bird's weekend. And um, I'm going to try, okay, so you're going to be receiving the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to do a screen share of what you're going to win. Um, okay, here we go. Oops, I have some. Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, hopefully this goes. This is the avium, uh, the popcorn. Um, oh wait, this is, wait, oops. There we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm always having a, a joy with these, uh, trying to play these videos. Okay, here we go. This is what you're gonna get, Jane. It's the popcorn nutri berries, um, which are a healthy snack, a healthy snack. And they look good. I think I could just have a bowl of this watching a, a Netflix show at home myself. <laughs> they look really good. Uh, you also get another uh, bag of the pure food in your bird stories. But um, there you go. Some bird specific popcorn trees. How cool is that? Going out to you and your bird. And there, on that note, I was going to wish everyone a, a very uh, safe um, Halloween this weekend for you and your flock. Right, of course. Everyone yes, keep the chocolate out of the beach, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you might be scaring your bird if you're wearing a costume they're not used to seeing you in. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody, for a fantastic webinar on this Halloween Eve of Eves. And uh, again, be safe and uh, have fun. All right, everybody, on that note, uh, all the best to you and your flock. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.